So before we get into the presentation, I'll point out again that up on the screen, we have DWR and CWCD's website. If those of you want to log in to get access to any of the materials, it's all there. So you can just uh, uh, add into that link. Hopefully that link's high enough above Ted's head that you can all see it. Or maybe I should say six, seven Hunter's head. So we have the agenda up on the screen. And we'll briefly uh, go through this. But first, I want to do uh, a welcome again to everybody for attending the second meeting of the Arizona Lower Basin Drought Contingency Plan Steering Committee meeting. Again, uh, these are really important meetings. We have a short time to get where we need to go. Appreciate everybody for coming and everyone's willingness to work with us and with each other. So quick logistical information, I'm told, out through the doors and right across the hall are water fountains, restrooms, etc. We don't have a break scheduled in this agenda, but we'll play it by ear as we kind of have done in the past in these meetings, and we may take a break at some point in the agenda. Uh, so the, I won't go through the agenda in detail, just a brief overview. Um, we're going to talk about upcoming meetings, schedule and locations. We're going to review the CAP water deliveries and the CAP Ag Settlement Pool Program. Some of the delegates are going to give a presentation on the CAP Ag Settlement Pool mitigation discussions to date. <clears throat> we will talk about potential CAP Ag mitigation water resources. Uh, and how we're going to work through that process in the next steps. Um, we'll have additional information uh, in response to questions and data requests for meeting number one. An additional opportunity if delegates haven't uh, been able to put out all their comments, thoughts, et cetera, as we work through the agenda. Uh, and then we'll have a brief discussion of what we're gonna do in meeting number three and then our call to the public. So we're going to first start by going around the table and having the delegates introduce themselves all or their alternates, um, <clears throat> who they represent and what sector they represent. But before we do that, I wanted to mention that we've heard from several delegates or their alternates that they're having trouble and ha had trouble already attending some of the meetings or some of the meetings into the future. So. We want to ask the delegates uh, to consider a one-time change in either the delegate or, or, or alternates and have that one change, one-time change effectuated by the, end, by the August 23rd meeting so that we can continue to have continuity and know who, who's going to be sitting around the table uh, moving forward through the meeting. So again, if any of the delegates want to change who the delegate is or nominate or appoint a different alternate, and you know that right now, that would be great to do that as part of the introductions. If you wanted to wait till the third meeting, um, we can do that as well. But we really want to set the roster in that third meeting. So we'll start by going out around the room. I think folks know I'm Tom Bushoski, the director of the Arizona Department of Water Resources. And we'll start at the table with Ted Cook. Good afternoon, Ted Cook, General Manager of the Central Arizona Project. Hunter Moore, Governor's Office. Atkins, Central Arizona Project. Brent Caesar, Central Arizona Project Board. Edward Manuel, Chairman of the Nation. Cynthia Campbell from the City of Phoenix. Rusty Bowers. The Senator Lisa Otondo, Legislative District 4. Representative Rosanna Gavaldon, LD2, and my alternate is going to be Representative Kirsten Engel. Spencer KM's Home Builders Association of Central Arizona. Jeff Cross, Senate Council, and on behalf of uh, Senator Gail Griffin. Ted Maxwell with the Southern Arizona Leadership Council. Brian B. Smyre, Scottsdale Water. Uh, Javier Cervic, City of Goodyear. I 
Yes, it's on Bill Garfield, Arizona Water Company. Technically challenged. Tim Tom, your Tucson Water. Cheryl Lombard, Valley Partnership for the Real Estate Development Industry. Dennis Patch, Chairman of Colorado Tribes. Stephen Rowe Lewis, Governor for the Gila River Indian Community. Glenn Hammer, Arizona Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Laura Grignano, Manager of the Central Arizona Groundwater Replenishment District. Sandy Favorites with Freeport. Steve Roberts on behalf of the Salt Lake Project. Jay West, President of Arizona County Board. Joe Olson, Metro Water District. Brian Wong, BKW Farms, representing Pine Pima County Agriculture. Lobos Wakimoto, Mojave County. Good afternoon, Ted Kowalski with the Walton Family Foundation representing the NGO community and Kevin Moran is my alternate. And Wade Noble, Yuma County Agriculture Water Coalition. <laughs> Virginia O'Connell, Arizona Water Banking Authority. David Godleski, Southern Arizona Home Builders Association. Paul Lorne, Pinnell County Irrigators. Shane Leonard, Roosevelt Water Conservation District, Maricopa County Agriculture. Good afternoon. I'm Leslie Myers with the Bureau of Reclamation. Uh, thank, thanks to all the delegates and alternates for those introductions. Again, thank you for members of the audience and public for attending as well. And thank you to all the other elected officials that are out there uh, in the audience with us today. We won't go through everyone one by one, but we appreciate you taking the time to come and participate in, with us as well. So a quick recap <clears throat> from the first meeting. I think we, we heard the uh, general support for the steering committee process from the delegates for the committee's mission, the objectives, and the things that we outlined in meeting number one. Again, just to remind folks of the mission of the steering committee, it's to discuss and recommend how to adopt and implement the lower basin drought contingency plan in a way that <clears throat> is acceptable to Arizona water users. The objectives include seek broad commitment and support for the implementation of the LBDCP in Arizona, recommend appropriate and sustainable processes and tools to implement the DCP in Arizona, obtain approval by the Arizona legislature of a joint resolution authorizing the director of ADWR to agree to the Lower Basin Drought Contingency Plan. We heard broad support from the delegates about the four key elements that we identified the last time, CAP Ag Settlement Pool Mitigation, Tribal Intentionally Created Surplus, CAP excess water and an Arizona water conservation plan. Uh, and we heard broad support from the delegates to begin with the CAP Ag settlement pool. Uh, and that's part of what we're going to de do here today. And then of course, follow up with that with tribal ICS. And again, we recognize that each one of these is an element of a package and that the package is a package is a package. And we will keep that in mind. And again, we've requested that delegates meet with their constituents to obtain their feedback. And we'll continue to uh, ask you to do that and look forward to hearing <coughs> that feedback from all of you throughout this meeting and future meetings. Uh, we are not, as we said last time, live streaming these meetings, but we are going to re record the meetings and we'll be posting them on our websites uh, after the meeting is finished. Okay, so that is a quick recap of our last meeting. <coughs> we'll move on to a recap of the draft schedule. You can see it up on the screen. The delegates probably have that in front of them. You can see we have an aggressive schedule through the end of November. We're alternating meetings between um, CWCD's headquarters where we'll be on August 23rd 
from one to four, and then my new home away from home for DWR, the Burton Bar Library. So you can see the schedule, point out that on no November 8th, we've not yet decided where the DWR meeting will be, but of course we'll let you know that as soon as we can confirm the location of that meeting. So now I am going to turn the uh, presentation and the agenda over to General Manager Ted Cook. Ted will be going through a series of slides. Uh, most of what <coughs> Ted is going through is really direct, directly related to operations of CAWCD and agreements and uh, things like that. The Water Settlement Act impacts on uh, CAWCD and their obligations that that creates. So Ted rightly will be doing most of that presentation. Uh, so Ted, take it away. Good afternoon again. Agenda item number three this afternoon will be a presentation specifically on ag mitigation and um, uh, led by, by Paul Orm and uh, some other um, participants. But before we get to that, the purpose of agenda item number two that I'm going to present is to give some context and background. We did get some, some specific questions last time about the ag pool. What is it? Who, who are members of it? How much water uh, does it, uh, does it um, offer? Uh, how much of that water are, are people using, things like that. So those are the type of questions that, that I hope to address this afternoon to provide context for what you're going to hear from Paul and, and uh, some other folks next on the agenda. CEP Agriculture has been a core piece of the Central Arizona Project well before CAP was ever, ever built. Um, three of the, of the key objectives of having a Central Arizona project are listed on, under the first bullet on this slide. To reduce groundwater overdraft in Central Arizona, preserve irrigated farm land in Central Arizona, and provide a water source to meet expanding municipal and industrial needs. And those were um, core features of a lot of the conversations that were going on leading up to the passage of the um, Colorado River Basin Project Act in 1968 and the discussions that occurred after that um, uh, forming CAWCD, uh, the discussions um, that, that led up to the groundwater management code being developed in Arizona and, and things like that. And in fact, um, uh, CAP Agriculture has played a role in satisfying each one of those goals as shown on, on the slide here. Uh, the districts themselves invested heavily in distribution systems that would enable them to, t to take uh, CAP water in their districts. Um, they borrowed from, uh, from the United States government to accomplish a lot of that, which added to some of the financial issues that I'll get to on the next, next slide. Uh, and, uh, to, but to put those in so they could use the CAP water to accomplish these goals and also improve efficiency of us using surface water. As far as preserving irrigated farmland in central Arizona, there were specific requirements that um, uh, farms had to be in production uh, for the 10 years preceding the Basin Project Act, 1958 to 1968. So these legacy farms were being preserved through these actions, and also those that were uh, um, uh, not only had been in existence but were legally authorized to farm in Arizona under state law would be eligible for CAP water. And to accommodate the transition from ag use to urban uses, um, the non-Indian ag subcontracts were based on a percentage of the supply not used by senior users. So that's an important point, at least in these early days, to understand that, that uh, non-Indian agriculture was kind of a floating quantity that would be available um, after satisfying the uses of the senior water rights holders, uh, contractors and subcontractors. A portion of the CAP repayment that was attributed to non-Indian ag is not deemed to be non-interest bearing. And in the early days of the repayment, the original repayment contract, uh, uh, because of the kind of floating nature of the non-Indian ag quantity, 
that uh, the percentage of the repayment that was that was not subject to interest was also floating, and it would be it would be recalculated and trued up every few years. In the uh, repayment settlement that occurred a few years later, and I'll have another slide on that in a moment, um, that percentage was fixed at 27%. So 27% of the CAP repayment principal is non-interest bearing, and that quantity is worth $650 million of interest that Arizona would otherwise have to pay uh, by virtue of having non-Indian ag part of uh, CAP deliveries. The slide is titled CAP Underutilization. As I've been through this packet now a few times, and I'd like to point out that underutilization was, is really uh, more of a result, I think, than, than, a, than a cause. But, and what underutilization in the early days resulted from was uh, that, that the projections, uh, early projections predicted that there would be a, uh, a, a rapid um, um, uh, use of, of a large percentage of the water that was available to CAP, primarily through this, what I called before, floating mechanism, where the water that wasn't ready to be used yet by the, the higher priority users would be absorbed by the agricultural use, non-Indian agricultural users. Well, that did not happen as quickly as it was assumed in those projections. In 1991, in particular, CAP deliveries were only about 500 uh, thousand acre, acre feet, about less than one third of the of the nominal supply available to to CAP, and and that or what that uh, to put that in perspective, the CAP um, first deliveries occurred in 1985. So this is another five or six years into it, and the deliveries are only about a half a million acre feet. Uh, because of the fixed cost of, of, of operating the canal, the prices, therefore, were much higher than were originally projected. And so that it placed additional pressure on the amount of water that the non-Indian agricultural community could, could use. Coupled with, uh, and, so, and everyone else too, the price went up for everyone else too, coupled with the debt that the districts had taken on to the United States to, to put in their distribution systems, this was extreme financial hardship. Uh, some districts did declare bankruptcy, and some were on pretty rocky financial uh, grounds. This alarmed a lot of folks, and in the early 1990s, Governor Symington convened a CAP advisory committee, two of them, one in 1992 and one in 1993. At about the same time, the CAP canal was declared substantially complete by the Secretary of the Interior, and CAP re repayment commenced in January of 1994. So here's one more financial obligation that's lumped on top of everything else uh, when the water usage was, was still quite small. In addition to that, one other milestone of the early 1990s was a repayment dispute arose between CWCD and the United States about the re reimbursable cost, and that ended up in litigation in 1995. So those, uh, those those uh, early 1990s were a tumultuous time. But like we do so often in Arizona, we came together and we found a way to work a lot of this out. One of the results and one of the recommendations coming out of the Symington Advisory Group was something that we now call the 1993 Target Pricing Program. And that was a multi-year pricing schedule that was published by CWCD. We do the same type of thing today. It's a little more sophisticated now, but uh, because we didn't have any history uh, uh, in those days, financial history. Um, and, and, the, and that pricing schedule was to address the financial challenges that were facing CWCD, the non-Indian Ag Districts, and the other, other users. Um, the target pricing program was uh, lower than the strict cost allocation. Um, and it took advantage of the fact that CWCD had some significant reserves that had accumulated because of property tax authority that the district had. Um, and it gave some certainty that what prices would be over a period of time that weren't just going to be variable based on absorbing all of the, all of the costs every year. And depending on what water was unused by the senior users, all of that burden would fall on primarily on these, on these uh, non-Indian ag districts. It reduced rate variability and uncertainty 
for the municipal and industrial users as well and tribal users by establishing this forward pricing uh, based on the fact now that uh, we would be more assured of having these interest savings on repayment that I discussed a minute ago and also on the fact that these reserves resist existed to help um, uh, pay uh, the, the repayment. The original ag pool contained three pools of excess water. I'll talk a little bit more about excess water and ag pools in, in, a, in a later slide. And um, those water, water pools were of, of various uh, quantities available in each pool and at various prices. And it was the first time that we saw in, in pricing mechanisms that the variable cost of energy was, was a big piece of this. And the requirement was that the lower cost earlier pools that was available first, that had to be used up, and then the next pool would become available for folks. But it was more expensive because the energy to produce that, to deliver that water would be more expensive. And we've seen those same kind of mechanisms um, later. We don't, we only have one energy rate today, but it's, it's interesting that this started way back then, uh, more than 20 years ago. These agreements then with uh, the non-Indian ag uh, 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 participants were uh, implemented through letter agreements between CAWCD and the individual districts. CAP issue, issues related to CAP Ag became also part of the repayment litigation that I, that I mentioned a moment ago. So it wasn't all about money. It was also uh, the, the litigation included and resolved several contractual issues. Um, and uh, the, just to remind everybody, that litigation started in 1995. It was wrapped up in 2000, and there was a final judgment, I think, in 2003 and 2004. And we've been operating under that regime ever, ever since. Um, the, un, under the settlement, and also as reflected in the Arizona Water Settlements Agreements and the Arizona Water Settlements Act, Congressional Act, um, uh, the ag districts agreed to relinquish their non-Indian ag subcontracts, which is what they had originally, in exchange for the creation of the ag settlement pool that we have today through 2030 and other considerations. One important aspect here, the, the, the sub-bullet under the second bullet, is that this floating ag pool was converted to fixed quantities, and that's what we, what we see today, and I think we have a, a slide on that later. Started out at, at 400,000 acre feet, stepped down to 300,000 acre feet in 2017, and then to 225,000 acre feet in 2024, and ending in 2030. The Ag Settlement Pool has first priority to CAP excess water. Oh, there's the numbers listed right there. And the, un, under this agreement and the settlement, the Ag Pool participants only pay for the electricity, the variable cost to deliver water, and the fixed cost is paid for by CAWCD, and the source of funds for that is property taxes. Uh, ag pool allocations are based on CAP eligible acres. I would like to, to point out a, a couple of things here. Even though um, we're talking now about the ag pool and the settlement, there were, this is not just all about ag, not just all about helping out, uh, non-Indian agriculture, this, these settlements helped out everyone. Um, the water that was relinquished by the uh, non-Indian ag subcontractors uh, was used, of course, to provide the excess water to create the ag pool, but um, long term, that water was available for Indian water rights settlements, some that, that occurred at this same time, some quantity that was set aside for future Indian water rights settlements, some quantity of water that was set aside for future M&I um, uh, allocation, some of which has already been recommended to be reallocated, but that has not happened yet, but we're following along with those, those um, provisions. And, uh, and the settlements themselves also protected the folks who would, would, would potentially have been harmed if, if uh, the, the um, uh, issues that were settled ended up being in litigation. So this was a huge win-win, I think, for many parties in Arizona. And lots of our organizations uh, that are represented here today, either at the table or in the audience, and maybe probably some people who are here in person, were signatories to those agreements in 
the early to mid 2000s. The repayment stipulation itself provides the basis for the CAP Ag settlement pool. It authorizes, and it's also reflected in the Water Settlements Agreements and the Water Settlement Acts. It authorizes CWCD to enter into contracts for the sale or use of excess water pursuant to multi-year programs established by CWCD. One of those is, a, as, as outlined in the settlement stipulation language, a dedicated non-Indian agricultural pool. So for those folks, and I've been asked this question, um, uh, why does this pool exist? It exists because of these agreements and the, and the express authority of CAWCD to establish this pool using excess water. Um, the settlement agreement itself, um, which was authorized, ratified, and confirmed by the Settlements Act in Congress, established the exact terms of this ag settlement pool. How much it would be, I went through that a moment ago, how long it would last, mentioned that a moment ago, what the priority would be of that pool. It's a first priority within the excess water pool and how the pricing uh, would be done as well. So that is the pool that is in existence today. It started in 2004, it's lasted until now, and it's supposed to go to 2030, uh, subject to availability of water. On the next slide is a map uh, you may have difficulty reading it in the audience. Um, there's another map that's in the packet that we provided for all of you that has, has, uh, um, shows all of the, of the ag districts. The map in the handout also shows the uh, uh, Indian tribal areas that, uh, that do irrigated agriculture as well. But there are 18 districts in the CAP ag pool. What we've shown here uh, is, is who they are. Uh, what their allocation is, which AMA or INA that they are located in, and, and the numbers on the right uh, add up to about 300,000 acre feet, which is the ag pool size today. Not all of 300,000 acre feet is being delivered today, and I'll get into why in, in uh, just, just a moment there. Um, I have to catch up on my slides here. Um, the allocation of, to the Phoenix AMA is about 42,000 acre feet. The Pinal AMA is the largest piece, which is 217,000 acre feet. Bearing in mind the total right now is at 300,000 acre feet. Tucson, a Tucson AMA is just under 7,000 acre feet. And Harquahela Valley Irrigation District is outside of the three AMAs, but has 24,000 acre foot allocation. Uh, out, of the, out of the ag pool. The two largest districts in Pinal County, which are the Central Arizona Irrigation and Drainage District, often referred to as KD, um, and the Maricopa Sc Stanfield Irrigation and Drainage District, often referred to as Maricopa Stanfield, uh, along with the Ak Chin um, uh, Indian community, uh, use the Santa Rosa Canal, which is the single largest turnout on the CAP system, just for that little piece of trivia there. I'd like to move now to a little bit more context um, on the size of the ag pool. But to understand that best, it, it probably we need to start with the um, entire Colorado River apportionment for Arizona. It's, as you all know, it's 2.8 million acre feet. This first graph shows the dark blue on the bottom is the on-river consumptive use. And that's uh, not completely flat, but pretty flat over the period of time that we're showing. 2004 to 2017, it's right about 1.1 million acre feet or a little bit more. And then the difference between that and Arizona's 2.8 million acre feet is taken by CAWCD for its contractors and subcontractors under the CAWCD contract. Um, those who looked closely can see that, because I got asked this question the other day, that. Uh, Gee, it looks like there was an overrun, overrun in 2009. Yes, there was. But you will also notice that 2010 and 11 are a little bit under that dotted line at the top there, 2.8 million acre feet. That's because we're required to pay it back if we do that. And Arizona faithfully observes <laughs> its contracts, and we, did, and we did that. We have taken the entire 2.8 million acre feet in Arizona since about 2000, um, except 
in 2005, and that was because that was a very wet year and we had a lot of agricultural users dial back their orders because they were getting free rain from God. Um, and and uh, so we were not able to take all of our 2.8 off the river that year. Since then, there have been a number of additional recharge projects that have been built that provides the capacity that if that ever happens again, we can take all of our water. I will note over to the right of the graph there, though in 15, 16, and 17, there actually is a tiny bit in 2014 as well, that we have not taken our entire 2.8 because as uh, the drought persisted uh, and Lake Mead and Lake Powell continued to decline, um, interstate and intrastate efforts were put together to begin to conserve some water in Lake Mead, leave some behind, even though for years and years it was take all the water so California doesn't get it. Um, and we had done that very successfully for a long time. Uh, um, priorities changed and, and we had a dual role here of making deliveries to people who needed water within Arizona and the economic value that provides and leaving some behind to keep the lake as healthy as it could be. So that's represented there in those little light blue bars there. That's not water taken, it's, it's water, water left. The next graph looks at the, the top half of the previous graph. Uh, the, C the deliveries by CWCD, it's a little bit more lumpy looking because the scale is smaller. Um, that shows a breakdown before, between the four major sectors of CWCD water delivery, CAP water deliveries. The dark blue at the bottom is federal contracts. These are the uh, tribal contractors. Um, th the next block up is municipal and industrial subcontracts. The next block up is the ag pool. And then the yellow color, I think it's yellow at the top, is what we call the other excess pool. The, the trends that you will notice on this graph, of course, is the more recent increase in uses by senior water users, both tribal and municipal and industrial, the two blue colors. The, the um, consistent deliveries to the ag pool, uh, and then in later years, the step down uh, the green slice is becoming smaller, and in 15 and 16, that was because of agricultural conservation programs, which I'll get into in a minute. And then in 2017, actually, the size of the ag pool reduced under its own terms from 400,000 acre feet to 300,000 acre feet. The most notable trend on here is excess water, which is everything else after tribal, municipal, industrial, and agricultural, um, which was pretty significant. Um, not, uh, a decade and a half ago is now dwindled down to, particularly after conservation in Lake Mead the last couple of years, to a, a pretty tiny but very important quantity. The last slide that I'll show about water delivery volumes is just the ag pool itself. And uh, we've really co covered most of that that uh, uh, since its inception in 2004, the ag pool has very consistently um, taken all 400,000 acre feet or very close to it. Uh, as I mentioned a moment ago, in 2015 and 16, um, the ag pool did not take all of its water because there were conservation programs that were in place that um, allowed some of that water to be left behind in Lake Mead in conjunction with lots of other folks. Um, and then in 2017, even though the ag pool dropped, that's the dotted line there at the top, dropped from 400,000 to 300,000 acre feet, uh, the ag pool deliveries were just a little bit more than 250,000. And that's, again, because of these, um, these uh, conservation programs. Speaking of which, uh, conservation in Lake Mead. This kind of um, gets at two things here, a little bit about uh, agricultural uh, um, uh, contributions to to Lake Mead conservation programs, but everybody else as well. And I've actually got two slides, this one and the next one, and it looks at it a couple of different ways. Um, this first one is what we will call by, by program. Um, the largest quantity, about 40% of the almost 900,000 acre feet that has been left by Arizona in Lake Mead since 2014, counting this year, is from CEP excess water. So despite that, that uh, rapid decline in the amount of other excess water that's available, a good portion of that has gone into Lake Mead uh, as part of these conservation programs. And what kind of programs we'll get into in, in a minute. 
To the right side there, the next biggest slice is uh, uh, agricultural uh, uh, forbearance projects under the CAP a Memorandum of Understanding with uh, other water agencies in California, Nevada, uh, in California and Nevada in the United States. Um, the, the purple slice there at the bottom is the federal government primarily funded um, uh, that uh, section of conservation. Uh, that was Gila River Indian Community and also the Fort McDowell Yavapai Nation. Uh, I say primarily funded by the United States because uh, Arizona Department of Water Resources, City of Phoenix, and also Walton Family Foundation contributed funds for a portion of the Gila River Indian Community conservation that was done in that, in that block. The dark uh, block at the bottom was what we call Arizona Pilot System Conservation Program. There's a lot of little programs, but it adds up. Uh, it's funded by Central Arizona Project, agencies from California, Nevada, and even uh, Denver Water in Colorado, um, and the United States um, paid for, for uh, that program. So again, almost 900,000 uh, acre feet in Lake Mead in the last four and a half years. This slide is, is another, um, another uh, rendition of uh, that conservation as well. Instead of being by program, it is by segment of, of uh, Arizona water use. Every segment of water use in Arizona is represented on this slide, and this is a huge success, I think, for Arizona that we're all doing this, this together in varying quantities, but everybody's contributed a little bit or more. Uh, sometimes the segments are exactly the same as the, as the program on the previous page, but starting at, at the bottom, we have some uh, on-river participants, includes um, uh, the Colorado River Indian Tribe and some other uh, non-Indian uh, contributors, um, including Yuma Area Ag. Uh, the next block up, the blue block, is a CAP long-term contractors. This includes a number of uh, cities, and I've got the list here. I'm going to read it in just a second. Um, and then uh, the green block is the agricultural pool, forbearance programs. I'll go into more detail on that. And then the yellow block is the other excess that has been left behind uh, by, by, uh, C by CAP. All in all, there have been, I have to find my slide where I have this written down because I'm a numbers guy, but I can't remember everything. Just have to find the right one is the problem. Forgive me. Okay. All in all, we had over 20 participants in Arizona that contributed to this 900,000 acre feet in Lake Mead. It included 11 CAP irrigation districts. I'm not going to name them because I have a slide on that. Four tribes, Colorado River Indian Tribe, Gila River Indian Community, Tona Atham Nation, and Fort McDowell. Four municipalities, Phoenix, Scottsdale, Purity, and Glendale. And then, of course, I mentioned the funding partners before, ADWR, Walton Family Foundation, uh, and the City of Phoenix um, on some of the uh, uh, tribal uh, forbearance programs. Um, other folks, like the City of Tucson, re had reduced their orders that were not counted as some of these programs, but that those kind of reductions provided more flexibility for uh, other things to occur, like how much excess water there was to, le to leave uh, in the lake as well. Um, and I'd also like to mention that because these programs cost money, um, and, and there were discrete contributors, but every CAP ratepayer and all the CAP taxpayers contributed to this as well. So. Once again, I'll, I'll toot that horn of Arizona-wide uh, working together to, to accomplish this. Um, the next slide, then, is a final breakdown of ag pool forbearance programs. There have been five programs, and this is the reason why the ag pool in recent years has not taken all of the water that's available to it, uh, is because they're helping out with this conservation. Um, there are five programs. It is a mix of intentionally created surplus and system conservation, and I want you to remember intentionally created surplus in particular, in particular because that's water that we can take back out of the lake later. 
um, funding from CWCD and all those other people that I mentioned before um, have contributed to some of this. ADWNR and CAWCD have worked together to modify policies that allowed some of these programs to happen to this day. And the most important one of those, I think, was that there was a longstanding rule, this is from the take all the water off the river days, that non-Indian ag wa uh, pool water users had to use all their CAP water first before they could enter into groundwater savings facilities agreements with partners. And uh, recently, it, um, uh, probably in 2015, I think, or 16, those rules were relaxed. I, if I recall correctly, Tom, it was one year we we're going to try it out, and then we made it permanent. Um, that uh, you don't have to do that anymore. And so there were, were, there were districts, mostly in Maricopa County and in uh, Pima County, where it was much more economical for them, and there was plentiful water available to enter into a GSF, and that allowed them, at a cost of nothing to anybody, to relinquish their CAP water, reduce those deliveries, and take GSF water instead, and leave that water in Lake Mead. That's forbearance three. And today, that continues to produce about 40,000 acre feet of, of conservation each year. I believe that that is the end of, uh, of the background on the genesis and evolution of the CAP ag pool that I hope provides a good context for the rest of the conversation today. So before we move to the next uh, set of presentations, we might have time for a few questions to clarify lots of information we just threw at you, many charts, graphs, et cetera. So any quick clarifying questions from Ted before Ted before we move on? Sandy. Just, just real quick, Ted, on the um, ag forbearance, is that also still interest-free when it's served in mead? I didn't hear the whole I'm sorry, the um, ag forbearance, is that still interest-free as well against the overall repayment? The, well, when, when the settlement was done, um, the, the interest, non-interest bearing split was fixed. And from 2004 through 2030 in the repayment um, uh, calculation for the amortization schedule assumes exactly the deliveries uh, under the ag pool, 400,000 acre feet from 2004 through 2016, and then 300 from 17 to 23, and then 225,000 acre feet after that, and a little bit of a tail going all the way out into the 2040s. Um, what we actually deliver, if it deviates from that, does not change the repayment calculation. We'll move on to the next. Want to tee it up? Yes. Um, the next the next item on the agenda is a uh, presentation by uh, Paul Orm representing the um, uh, ag non Indian agriculture Pinal County in particular. Um, and we need to switch to the other presentation now for the folks that are doing that. Um, uh, he, I believe, Paul, that you're going to have uh, is it Kev Kevin Moran, who is the alternate for Ted Kowalski representing NGOs is going to, I believe, introduce this topic, and then uh, Paul will take over. Part of the conversation will be an, an overview, I think, of uh, ag mitigation concepts, and it gets pretty specific, but also a report out on some of the discussions that have been taking place in recent months that includes not only um, uh, Paul and his constituents, but also Walton Family Foundation, EDF, City of Phoenix, City of Tucson, and maybe, maybe a few other folks. So thank you, Kevin. <coughs> it's the usual clicker left, right. So I don't know if you're I am coming not. through slides. Paul's okay. got the slides. Thank you, Ted and Tom. I'm Kevin Moran, Environmental Defense Fund Western Water Program alternate for Ted Kowalski and the Walton Family Foundation. I also represent Water for Arizona Coalition. It's a group that includes Business for Water Stewardship, Audubon, American Rivers, Western Resource Advocates, and EDF, which collectively comprise over 60,000 Arizonans across our membership. Our goals are briefly, which I was asked to, to affirm and confirm by, uh, by our co-chairs, our goals 
are to achieve uh, a DCP for the lower basin, to get the benefits to the stability of the river system and that environment, and to do so as much as possible in a way that the intra-Arizona provisions are sustainable. That's our goal. So uh, about six months ago, uh, the Water for Arizona Coalition and EDF looked at the situation uh, that we were looking at with what was keeping us from getting to a lower basin drought contingency plan. Uh, it wasn't news to us or any of you that mitigation for potential impacts of a DCP to CAP agriculture was one of the issues that needed additional focus, resources, and authentic dialogue. Based on that recognition, we invited folks to a meeting. And uh, lo and behold, they showed up. So Phoenix, Tucson, uh, EDF, and Paul, representing his clients, uh, the collectively the largest users of CAP agricultural sediment pool, uh, started meeting. So I'll just say right up front, uh, our conversations have the virtues and the limitations of those who were present. Number two, I'll say you're not going to hear a deal today. You're not going to hear a proposed deal today. I think it's fair to say, Paul, where you're going to hear a lot of good information from Paul's client, Paul and his clients about the need, but you're really going to hear a report on this authentic dialogue. Uh, what I would say is we hope that we've made a contribution in a constructive way by having this group convene uh, in a way that has allowed the participants, those who are directly participating, to clarify their views of CAP Ag mitigation in relation to other issues. Because we know that the issues that we've teed up, the four issues that have been offered and articulated by our co-chairs and, and the, uh, that we're working on as a steering committee, we know that they are interlocking. The last thing I would say is, uh, I ask your indulgence and perhaps forgiveness. We always knew these conversations were always in the frame of respecting existing contract rights, respecting existing treaties and settlement rights. But what could be done by the parties in a collaborative way? And what concepts could we develop that might move us forward? And so that's where this conversation came from. And uh, Paul, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Um, by way of reintroduction, my name is Paul Orm. I'm a Phoenix-based attorney. And for uh, over 35 years, I've uh, represented most of these irrigation districts you see listed in a variety of capacities, uh, most recently as their general counsel. Uh, combined, they have entitlement to approximately 70% of um, the agricultural settlement pool, which is the reason I'm standing up here today, I'm sure. Um, and uh, th th these, land, these districts will have lands mostly located in Pinal County. Um, one of the districts, uh, or actually two of these smaller districts, are actually in the Phoenix AMA, but there's, most of their lands are still located in, um, in Pinal County. And they reflect over 200,000 acres and um, roughly over 200 mostly uh, family-owned farms. So uh, before I get started, I do want to um, express our gratitude uh, to Kevin and the Walton Family Foundation for bringing this mitigation group together. I think um, um, we expressed our concerns years ago about what the potential impact of a DCP shortage would be on Pinell County agriculture in particular. Um, and um, um, while I would say, you know, some folks expressed genuine concern and, and, wanted, to, and wanted to find ways to, uh, to resolve uh, these issues, it really took EDF stepping up to say, we want to convene a group with, you know, a select number of major water users recognizing it wouldn't, couldn't include everybody. There were no commitments being made. There's still no commitments, no agreements. Um, and in fact, I think, I think, uh, Tim and Cindy from uh, Tucson and Phoenix would say, you know, generally we see the world differently. Um, um, the farming community doesn't see the, world, the water world the same way the big cities do. And that's, um, that's a kind of a, a gap we needed to try to bridge. And I think while we didn't necessarily bridge that gap, 
we certainly understand, I think, each other's positions better, and that's a starting point for uh, ultimately trying, trying to bridge the gap. But again, without Kevin stepping up and, and, and pursuing this, and without the able uh, facilitating of Patrick Cunningham of high ground, I, I don't think we would have um, gotten this, this particular effort off the ground. So with that said, um, you saw a side, slide from Ted showing the uh, various CEP irrigation districts that make up the agricultural settlement pool. Um, I don't know if this pointer works, it does. Um, you can see western Maricopa County has some districts uh, uh, with small allocations, also eastern Maricopa County. Um, the Pinal County districts um, are near the Gila River Indian Reservation, Maricopa Stanfield, um, one of the largest uh, Pinal County districts, has the Ochen Indian community right in the center of, of the district. Um, the Central Arizona Irrigation and Drainage District uh, is f uh, towards the south, um, uh, near the town of Eloy, surrounding the town of Eloy. Then you up, up in um, uh, the Coolidge area, you have the Hohokam Irrigation and Drainage District and the San Carlos Irrigation and Drainage District. Um, and then down farther south, you have BKW Farms, Cortero Morana. Those, those districts make, I mean, make up pretty much the, the Tucson AMA. AMA districts. Again, they have small allocations. Uh, roughly 75% of the ag pool is allocated in uh, Pinal County, to, to Pinal County districts. And, and uh, my remarks are going to be Pinal County centric for that reason and the fact that those are where my clients reside. So looking at Pinal County districts, um, th these numbers are from 2016. I don't think they've changed substantially. Uh, the service area acres are acres that are technically eligible for irrigation water under state and federal law. Um, the farm, actual farmed acres are what are, are essentially being farmed uh, out, of, uh, out of the total service area acres uh, in 2016. And again, I don't think it's, con it's appreciably different today. Uh, but you can see the total acreage is about 283,000 and the actual farmed acreage is just under, under 200,000. So reiterating a little bit of what Ted talked about, because this is really um, the genesis of our, of our political position in these discussions. Under the 2004 Arizona Water Settlement, as, as Ted laid out, and um, I personally lived through um, the entire history uh, Ted laid out, including the uh, initial construction of these highly efficient CAP delivery systems, the inability to take the water in the early 90s because of the excessive cost. Um, several of my clients filed uh, um, um, Chapter 9 bankruptcy, um, uh, irrigation districts filing, filing what's called municipal bankruptcy. Um, it, was a di it was a very difficult situation. Arizona wasn't utilizing anywhere near its full CAP entitlement. Nevada and California were very eager to latch on to that because of, because of that reason. And so the state came together and basically developed a plan that would allow agriculture to begin using this water. That led us up to the uh, 2004 Arizona Water Settlement. In that settlement, um, um, significant and real claims um, for winner's rights water were filed on behalf of several of the Arizona tribes. Those claims had to be addressed and they threatened potential existing water supplies for many municipal and agricultural water users in the central Arizona community. Ultimately, many of those claims were settled. But they were settled by water that was released by the CAP irrigation districts for the most part. As Ted pointed out, all the CAP irrigation districts released, uh, relinquished their long-term CAP contracts so that there'd be water to fuel the settlements in these tribal water rights claims. And in return, the districts got not only the waivers from the tribes, which are important, but three major other considerations. They got relief from most of the 
um, federal distribution system debt that they incurred in building their CAP systems um, that were uh, hundreds of millions of dollars apiece. They still had to pay, at least most of the districts did, the 20%, which was non-federal, those were through the issuance of private bonds. Those, uh, those fees still had to be paid. The second main piece of, of consideration was relief from something called the Reclamation Reform Act of 1982, which was a law, federal law, that restricted the number of acres you could get uh, federal project water on, in this case, uh, CAP water. And lastly, and most importantly for our purposes, was this creation of this agricultural water settlement pool in declining amounts beginning in 2004, and uh, Ted went over these, but a 400,000 acre foot pool from 2004 to 2016, declining to 300,000 acre feet from 2017 to 23, and then 225,000 acre feet from 2024 through 2030. That was a fundamental and critical piece of this deal for the CAP irrigation districts, and in particular for Pinell County, which had no other real surface water supplies available to it. Um, in, the, in, in, in general, not in every situation, but in general, uh, during this time period, the Pinell irrigation districts have used anywhere from 60 to 70 percent of their total water supply, um, maybe even in one other district even higher than that, has been the C their CAP water. The remaining water they use generally is groundwater. But we always anticipated, once the settlement was done, that we would have to transition away from that surface water ultimately, but not until after 2030. Um, even today, we see the transition occurring. Uh, the two largest Pinell County districts that I represent um, are now about roughly 50% CAP, 50% groundwater, and it's continuing to move more in, in the groundwater direction. So let's talk a little bit about CAP uh, in, in, in agriculture and Pinell County agriculture in particular. In a, in a 2015 study, um, it was, the, it was uh, pointed out that about $750 million had been invested in uh, CAP agricultural uh, water distribution and farm efficiency programs, resulting in an overall efficiency of 85%, farm efficiency of 85%, and reduced delivery losses down to 3% 3, 3 This is extraordinarily efficient irrigation based on comparison of Western water project, reclamation projects throughout the nation. There's a diverse mix of crops grown in, in the Pinal County districts um, that, su that's, that supports significant beef, beef and dairy production. In fact, Maricopa and Pinal counties are ranked in the top 1% of all counties in the, in the United States for cattle inventory and milk sales. Pinal County farms serve over 220,000, provide feed for over 220,000 beef cattle raised in uh, numerous feeding, very large feeding operations in Pinal County which have direct sales of roughly $348 million a year. Some of the large feeding operations include Pinnell feeding in Maricopa and Red Rock feeding in the Eloy area. There are also over 25 dairies in, in Pinnell County that these districts provide, provide feed for, um, re representing 90,000 dairy cattle. And they supply dairy products throughout Arizona. And this is a picture of the Shamrock Farms uh, in Stanfield. So you've seen this slide several times in, um, in these meetings. And this is really what we're talking about today. Under the current guidelines, the 2007 guidelines, 
Should we get into a tier one shortage? Will Lake Mead gets below level 1075. The, the CAP has to take a delivery reduction of 320,000 acre feet. That will not only eliminate the lower priority excess water, but it will eliminate half the ag pool. Well, that is the baseline for our discussions. We are not trying to improve upon that situation. We understand that that is the hand we've been dealt, that is what the priorities demand, and that that is what we have to live with. So and I think at certain points, um, it was mischaracterized that we were trying to improve our current situation. Uh, we are not. We understand that this is the current situation, this is the baseline, because it's what the existing 2007 guidelines require. However, the problem becomes when you overlay the additional 192,000 acre foot reduction on top of the 320,000 acre foot reduction under a DCP shortage, you can see that the ag pool is eliminated altogether as is a, some, a, a little bit of the NIA priority pool. And this is what has been unacceptable to us and why we have um, opposed a DCP plan that does not address ag mitigation. We can't be pushed into a zero CAP water situation. So this slide basically is just a narrative of what, uh, the, what, what I just pointed out. Um, we, uh, uh, if in fact we were forced into a no CAP water situation under a DCP shortage, um, we would have to rely 100% on our groundwater supplies um, and as opposed to an orderly transition to having to rely on those groundwater supplies at the end of 2030, which is what our expectations were under our 2004 settlement. That will obviously add considerable stress to the groundwater table in Pinell County for other users who share in that groundwater table. And it will create considerable water delivery problems within our irrigation districts. Because the fact of the matter is, we can't deliver groundwater to every location in our, in our districts. There, there, there are portions that can only receive CAP water. Secondly, our water delivery systems were designed to deliver surface water. So they require a certain amount of flow and head, head flow to be able to move the water through the system and get them all the way to the end of a field. Without surface water to do that, we can't efficiently irrigate all our, all, all our, all, all our farmland with groundwater. So intuitively, and I've said this to the press before and been corrected by my irrigation district managers, intuitively I've said, well, half our water supply is groundwater. If we lose all our CAP water, half our agricultural land goes out of production. Not so, my managers tell me. More than half will go out of production because we can't deliver the CAP or the groundwater efficiently by itself through our systems. So, as the bottom bullet point here shows, a zero surface water scenario presents an unacceptable risk of devastating economic and groundwater impacts to Pinell County. So we got to, so uh, moving on to discussing, okay, how do you, how could you mitigate that impacts? And our target on, on mitigation is that half a supply that would still be available to us if we just stayed under the 2007 guidelines. That's the half that gets eliminated under a DCP shortage. That amount will, is roughly 50% of the ag pool 
or somewhere between 120,000 to 150,000 acre feet a year, depending on whether Phoenix and Tucson AMA users need to participate in mitigation. They generally don't use the ag pool because they have more affordable uh, sources of water available to them uh, through storage arrangements with um, Phoenix and Tucson a a AMA folks and tribes. So um, they essentially, um, th they may or may not have those available in the future, but th there's, a, there's a possibility they don't really need mitigation. Uh, Pinnell, it's Pinnell County itself, districts would need roughly 106,000 acre feet of mitigation in order to remain whole under a DCP shortage. What the term we're talking about would be from the first year the shortage is declared under a DCP through the year 2026. Well, when I presented this to my clients, they said, wait a minute, our deal is through 2030. What's this 2026 stuff? Well, 2026 is when the 2007 guidelines have expired. There's no possible way the state or CAP can make any kind of commitments to us beyond 2026 at this point. So I think the best we can hope for in these discussions is um, that the state negotiators, when the time comes to negotiate the, uh, the successor to the 2007 guidelines, will just consider the impacts on CAP agriculture uh, through 2030 in those negotiations. I think that's the best we can achieve, and, um, and that's what we're, um, we're willing to, uh, to accept. So this is a summary of, of um, what I've said, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna read this because it's, it's critical to our position. The mitigation targets track ag pool supply available at 2007 guideline shortage tiers because DCP cuts are meant to protect lower meat elevations and higher priority water. This is the gist of our fairness argument here. The, the presentations that Ted and Tom have made previously show that the purpose of DCP is really to protect late mead down to level 1020. And that makes and to ensure it drops no further. If it, if it is protected to that level, then it's not going to impact the original long-term allocations of the, tr the cities and tribes, of, of C CAP users, cities and tribes. It'll impact their NIA priority water, but it won't impact their long-term original high priority water. That's what DCP is designed to protect. We understand that by under any scenario, if Lake Mead gets down in the 1020 range, the water for agriculture has been long gone. But our position here is it's fundamentally unfair that we lose all our water in order to protect a, or, or in, order to, in order to further a program that ultimately doesn't benefit us at all. The burdens should follow the benefits to at least some degree. We recognize we lose half our water under the 2007 guidelines. Nobody else takes a serious hit like that. And that's applying the priorities. We recognize that. But it's fundamentally unfair to ask us to bear the rest of the burden to a no water scenario for a program that at the end of the day doesn't benefit us because we're off the project by 2030 anyway. So again, the, t uh, the mitigation amounts we're looking at in a tier one is 120 to 150,000 acre feet. If we get into a tier two shortage under the 2007 guidelines, we still have about 20% of the ag pool. So we'd be looking for mitigation, something in the 45 to 60,000 acre foot range. Um, I should add that um, Phoenix and Tucson have made it very clear in these discussions, they don't support a tier two mitiga ag mitigation program. Um, we still believe it's a, it's a fair and important thing to address, but we have no, no agreement on that at all in our, in our discussions. And then lastly, we recognize that as the ag pool is supposed to drop another 25% in 2024, uh, 20, uh, 24 under our settlement, then the, that would correspondingly drop the mitigation amounts 
by the same 25%. So your tier one mitigation amount would be 90,000 to 112 roughly, and the tier two, you can see, you can see that as well. So the second major thing, once we identified the problem, we thought, okay, what's available, potentially available? Well, how can we brainstorm ways to come up with mitigation water? These are all controversial. They all require money. Um, a lot of people in this room hate, you know, three or more of these. But um, they're the kind of thing you have to get out on the table to discuss. And um, uh, so that's what we're doing. And um, then I think um, uh, maybe Ted or someone's going to elaborate on further. Again, I will say, in, a, in our small group, there was no agreement on this. Um, these are just things we threw out there to discuss. But there's absolutely no agreement necessarily on any of them. Um, so the, the first one is uh, CAP, controlled water stored in Lake Pleasant. Ted will talk more about that. The second is CAP, intentionally created surplus. Um, much of it through ag forbearance programs. Ted will talk more about that. The third would be a potential voluntary conservation of higher priority water with a genuine history of use as a contribution to shortage reductions. Um, this could, if, if some higher priority water that, uh, was used to, to, to uh, cover some of the DC, additional DCP cuts, it would take less pressure off the ag pool to do that. So this, is, uh, this would be a, undoubtedly a compensated program um, and would be something worth exploring in our judgment. The fourth is fairly technical, would require a massive amount of cooperation among multitudes of parties. Um, it's very creative, um, but it basically would be taking water, and again, remember, this is only in times when we're in shortage, so, but it would be taking water that currently is being stored in underground storage facilities, which are basically you know, dry stream beds, artificial reservoirs, and that kind of thing, that generally are either being stored for, to generate water credits to sell or uh, to use many decades down the road um, to take some of that water, move it into GSF facilities, that's groundwater savings facilities, which are essentially irrigation districts, to free up to, to then encourage more water that is being stored for the purpose of generating credits to being put in irrigation districts. We understand that you know, there's some, certainly some USFs that would not be subject to this kind of, um, this kind of program. I'm thinking particularly of the uh, Gila River Indian communities and even much of what Tucson does in a, in a, in a very specialized fashion. But uh, we have done a deep dive on the amount of water going into these facilities. We think this is uh, something that could be accomplished. With respect to moving more water into the Pinell AMA GSFs, we do have to solve the problem of how do you increase the benefit or the value of those Pinell AMA credits. Um, the Gila River Indian community has already been a very good partner with the um, uh, Pinell irrigation districts in storing water, but at some point they're going to want to know, okay, how can we get some benefit for this storage? How can we benefit from these credits? So that's a problem that a lot of smart people in this room will hopefully be interested in trying to solve. The fifth is uh, something that's been discussed in some detail, imported groundwater uh, from groundwater supplies that are near the, uh, um, the CAP delivery system. Uh, that, that could be a very expensive proposition, um, which is why it, it maybe isn't one of the most practical, but it's certainly a possibility. It's the one that brings in new water. It's the only one that really brings in new water into the solution here. The rest of this is just moving kind of water around. Um, this, the sixth item is short-term leases of higher priority water that uh, could possibly be made as mitigation water. We're, we're talking you know, a short period of time here, somewhere between 2020 and, 20, and 2026. Um, and if we're lucky, it won't be, any, it won't be 2020. Will mm -hmm. go into shortage. So there might be some opportunities for some folks uh, who have high priority water to lease them on the short term to support a mitigation program along these lines. And then lastly, um, um, potentially compensating 
uh, the farmers who have to take their land out of production because the DCP shortage is just taking the water away from them. Um, that, uh, that is not really the first choice of any of my clients because their business is to deliver water and to ensure a robust Pinell County economy by the delivery of that water, but it's one that uh, has been put on the table by some. So that's all I'm going to get into on those potential sources. Um, hopefully, if the, as the mitigation discussions move forward, there'll be a deeper dive on, on, on many of those. And, and maybe there's others we haven't even thought of. And I hope there, I hope there are other thoughts. Mm -hmm. But this is what basically our group could come, could come up with in the, uh, in the few months that we were, we were meeting. So funding. All of these will require some level of funding. Um, the first bullet here is the one I've harped on for a, a few years, the CAP. People are sick of me talking about this. But as Ted pointed out, under the current settlement, CAP covers the OM&R costs of the water delivered to the ag pool. If there's no ag pool water to delivery, that frees up the tax revenues they've been using to, under, to underwrite those costs. It seems to me fair that at least a portion of those freed up tax revenues ought to go to supporting an ag mitigation program. And that's what uh, one of the pitches that we've been pushing for quite some time and th is that, you know, there'll be a freed up tax revenue stream. Now, it, it probably shouldn't all go to the ag mitigation program because there's going to be other impacts on other users to mitigate if we get into shortage, M and I rates will increase, and perhaps some of that water, some of that money should go to to, um, to mitigating some of those M and I rate increases. But nonetheless, there is some money there because CAP won't have an ag pool to cover the OM and R costs, which is what they would have expected to do under the settlement through 2030. Um, I'm scared to say this one with the legislators in the room. <laughs> State legislature appropriations. My ag lobbyists tell me, don't hold your breath, Paul. But um, again, if the state really is, is vested in wanting this DCP, maybe this is an appropriation um, they should consider. NGO contributions. Um, Kevin and others have made it very clear that um, they're willing to put their money where their mouth is and wanting a DCP. They've already invested in system conservation. Um, so I think this is, a, this is an opportunity that needs to be explored. We always throw in federal, so, you know, why not? Um, and then lastly, other, again, there may be things that um, uh, we haven't thought of. So that's what we've uh, basically been able to come up with funding, potential funding sources. Again, no agreements, no commitments, nothing like that, but it has to be an issue that gets discussed uh, and considered. So now circling back to, um, to our process. Um, again, as, as Kevin already mentioned, I'm not going to repeat how this process came about, but he approached us uh, about being part of this discussion. He felt it was needed to get a DCP accomplished. Um, we've worked uh, with, with High Ground and, and Kevin and his folks to uh, come up with some ideas um, that we haven't even agreed to among ourselves, as, I, as I've said. Um, but our, but our, the, the goals of the parties that participated in this, from the irrigation district standpoint, it was to seek solutions to mitigate the impacts of the DCP reductions on agriculture and Pinell Ag in particular, and for the cities. Uh, uh, it was a broader package of some other things that they wanted to see accomplished, uh, including some Arizona water bank reforms, um, some changes in the way excess water is utilized, and also some uh, look at a hard look at some of the CAGRD um, uh, statutes and policies. Uh, one other that I didn't get uh, uh, on on this slide in uh, in, in time was um, they uh, they want to look at the allocations of the state land department M and I water. Um, they feel that issue needs to get resolved. 
And I'm not going to really expand on any of those because I'm not, I'm not really an expert in any of them. Uh, there's folks in the room who are. So if, if you really have questions relating to those, I will defer them to the uh, appropriate folks. Um, but ag again, uh, it's important to point out the parties have not reached any consensus on these difficult issues, but all parties agree that the time spent to date has been worthwhile in carefully sorting through the possible proposals and the various points of view. So thanks for your attention. So stay up there for a second, Paul. Thank you. So Paul mentioned the deeper dive that needs to be done later on in the agenda. We'll get into that issue and, and the process we're going to put together to get to that deeper dive. But if there are any quick questions, clarifying, et cetera, for Paul before we take a short break, uh, keeping in mind that we are going to do that deeper dive, uh, now's the time. From the delegates, Representative Bowers. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Paul, when we mentioned the possible movement or uh, realigning of the underground storage tank, underground storage tank, Another yes. part of my life, <laughs> moved on storage Point facilities um, to Pinal County uh, groundwater storage facilities. What's the capacity available in Pinal County? Well, each of the large districts, I think, has a, a permitted um, capacity of roughly 240,000 acre feet. Um, so they can take a lot okay. um, if there's nothing. I mean, it all depends on how much groundwater they're using. They can only take the, the GSF water in lieu of groundwater they could be pumping. Right. So, um, um, okay. so they have large capacity, but they're going to be utilizing their own groundwater. Uh, we, overall, the way we've looked at this particular issue, it, it's, if you had enough folks willing to participate in this, in this project, um, there's probably 70 to 90,000 acre feet a year you could, you could do. Again, it requires a massive amount of cooperation among a lot of folks, right. and, um, um, but we think it's a, it's a doable solution if there's commitments there. Okay, Mr. Chairman. And then on the last page, when you mentioned that the city's present in these overall discussions, and granted there's no uh, finality, but a recognition of the importance, uh, can you tell me, are the only cities that were there to talk about this would be Phoenix and Tucson? Were there other cities that? No, that only, only, Phoenix, only Phoenix and Tucson. And any idea of what those reforms for the AWBA might be or other excess water reforms? I, I'm, assu I'm assuming those will be discussed in a, in a more, um, uh, in, 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 a different, in a different forum. I mean, if um, uh, Cindy to your right wants to say something or, or, or Tim, um, I'd, I'd prefer they answered them because they're much more the expert on those issues than I am. Okay, thank you right. very much. Yeah, thank one, you. one other thing I guess I want to point out before I sit down, because I made a note when Ted was talking about it, because I don't think it, it, it can, its importance can be underscored. Um, and even though, even though um, we no longer have kind of the valuable tool from agriculture standpoint, that how much water was delivered to ag each year could then reduce CAP's overall repayment obligation. We used to depend on that very much before the, before the 2004 settlement because it was a real incentive to make sure water was available to agriculture because of the non-interest bearing component of that water. That, that repayment benefit is embedded, in, as, as Ted pointed out, is embedded in the set repayment now CAP makes to the United States. And, and the assumptions on that repayment benefit are there. So again, in our view, there's, a, a, there's a, an obligation of some sort for CAP to make every effort possible to deliver this much water to agriculture because they're reaping the benefit. And so are all those who pay for the CAP. They're reaping the benefit of of those deliveries that have been assumed, but no longer necessarily have to occur. There are a couple other hands. Oh. Bill. <laughs> uh, Paul, 
Paul, just one quick question. Uh, I think you referred that in uh, tier one shortage under DCP that you would have no cap deliveries, but are you presuming that there's no GSF deliveries during that time? No, only ag pool deliveries. No, no ag pool deliveries. Okay, because I, I think you have to uh, look at, at pers the perspective of the, especially in light of the proposal to divert water that would otherwise go to a USF to a GSF in Pinal. I think you're, you know, you really need to look at the, the totality of the water delivered, even if it's under GSF. I know they're regulated differently, but when you look at wet water to, to find, try to find some way to mitigate this, I don't think you can look at them uh, you know, excluding one from the other. No, no, I Just think, um, you know, this, this uh, whole exercise is really determining um, how much ag pool water is available. Um, we'd be delighted to have continuing GSF water available, but I think that's uncertain in Pinal County until we determine uh, the value of those, of those credits. And I'll add, Bill, the flip side of that coin is uh, Tier 1 with DCP may limit entities' ability who have GSF water going to Pinal County now still going there. So those are the types of discussions that need to occur in the deep dive that we'll get into. So seeing no other, Joe? Uh, just a clarification, Paul. On the USF to GSF transfer, you mentioned that all these potential mitigation solutions require funding. On the USF GSF, are you looking at funding of an incentivization beyond the $12 in lieu of rebate that would be paid by the agricultural districts receiving the GSF water? I, I think most of the most of the um, the funding we talked about was how you induce the tribes, who are the most logical candidates, to move water from Phoenix USFs and GSFs to Pinal GSFs. Um, how you induce them? to do it, and that's where most of the, the funding would, would, would need to occur. Okay, so we'll take a quick break. There are refreshments outside the door, and we will convene promptly at 2.45. All right, we're going to get back to the agenda. We're going to get into now a discussion by General Manager Ted Cook about some potential resources for mitigation. He's going to go back to the slide presentation. And then we'll get into, after that, I do my thing. Uh, the proposed next steps for CAP Act settlement pool mitigation and the rest of our agenda. It looks like Ted has showed us his technical expertise and he's ready to go. Go ahead, Ted. How you doing? We figured we'd just bring it on. Okay. Well, I know everyone's pleased to see me back up here again. Part two for of TED. Hopefully it's not part two of your nap. For those of you who took one before, <laughs> this is going to be much more exciting. So I would like to go. The first part was exciting, too. This is going to be much more exciting. Um, I'd like to go back for a moment. I'm not going to put the slide up on the screen. But um, one of the slides that Paul Orm showed was a <coughs> list of seven, I'll call them suggestions, of possible um, um, resources that we can explore together to put together an ag mitigation program of some sort. Now, in my opinion, the, the, the order of the list looks to me like easiest to hardest, although easy and hard is relative, and I'm sure that there are lots of folks who have a different opinion than I do, but that's just, that's just my opinion. Our hope... Um, uh, uh, meaning Tom's and mine in, in conjunction working with Paul and the folks that helped him uh, was to put that list up there to um, prompt additional discussion by other folks, actually the people that own those resources that, uh, that uh, were suggesting be explored for use. 
So two, the first two that are on that list are under the purview of, of CAWCD, and so I would like to take the first step in, in being prompted to have a little discussion about what those things are. And Tom, we'll get to later in the agenda when we talk about next steps about where we will do this deeper dive we keep referring to. Most of that will not be in here, it'll be somewhere else, and we'll bring the results of that back to this group. We'll talk about that more later. So the first thing on Paul's list was uh, water, available water in Lake, in Lake Pleasant. Now Lake Pleasant, just to remind everybody, this is CAP's regulatory storage reservoir. Regulatory not as in a, a regulation or a law, but as in uh, regulates the flow of the aqueduct system to kind of even out supply and demand lumpiness during the year. So during part of the year, water is put in the lake, and part of the year, the water is take out, taken out of the lake for that purpose. The lake doesn't always end up at exactly the same spot every year. Sometimes we're a little bit ahead of where we were, and sometimes we're a little bit behind of where we were. Some of you may recall a couple of years ago in a conversation about, hey, there's some water in Lake Pleasant that uh, could be available for, for use. And most of us, including me at the time, were oblivious to the fact that there might be a situation where there's more water in Lake Pleasant than we really need to have there for operational purposes. And that was the case a couple of years ago, where for several years in a row, I think I might be off by a year one way or the other, 13, 14, and 15, that uh, the plan was to, to take a little water out of Lake Pleasant because it was getting a little bit higher than we needed it to be. And in each one of those years subsequently, now we didn't, we didn't, were unable to do that because of turn back water and things like that. And the lake got a little bit higher and a little bit higher and a little bit higher. And so when we were having some discussions a few years ago and we suggested, you know, there's some water on Lake Pleasant that could be used for ag mitigation or other purposes as part of the earlier version of DCP discussions. And as a matter of fact, at that time, there was some discussion about if we wanted to, there, we could probably even collect more water in Lake Pleasant, um, uh, probably at the expense of putting water in Lake Mead, but there's value to, to diverse supply, um, if we wanted to do that and have even more before the onset of DCP. Well, that didn't pan out. We didn't do that. And so the quantity that's available in Lake Pleasant now is a little bit less than it was a couple of years ago, but there still is some there that, uh, that um, uh, we might be able to, to use. I think I'm actually ahead of myself, right? I'm supposed to be talking about um, ICS. I'm going to come back to that and finish this. So as I said before, Lake Pleasant Reservoir is a multi-use facility that CAP shares with Maricopa Water District. So if you may recall, Lake Pleasant, uh, this is uh, impounded behind the new Waddell Dam. There was a Waddell Dam that was there before. It was breached and the size of the lake was expanded. And we now share that lake with, with uh, Maricopa Water District. Um, we have our own between CAP and, and Metro, and um, there I go. Maricopa Water District. Every time I see MWD, I'm programmed to say Metropolitan Water District. Um, I have our own independent water supplies. It's co-mingled co in there, but it's accounted for separately. Um, and the lake has about 800,000 acre foot capacity. Uh, most of that it belongs to CAP. Um, and again, it, it fluctuates widely during the year. Um, MWD stores their Agrafria River water in the lake, and we store uh, primarily Colorado River water in the lake as well. Um, as I mentioned, it's our regulatory reservoir. Uh, we've got an operational reserve of 60 to 90 day water supply in there, and the rest of what's in there is, is uh, energy management for CAP system and to maintain um, water supply to ensure our scheduled water deliveries can be made if there's an interruption, flood control, and, rec and recreation. Right now, today, there's about 50 to 70,000 acre feet more than we need for those operational purposes. And it's more of a coincidence of this up and down in the lake, and just then, now today it's a little bit higher um, than it actually needs to be. It's not hurting anything, but it's an available resource right there. Um, uh, operational storage in, in, uh, in Lake Pleasant is CAP project water, and that could be, depending on what the CAP Board of Directors decides to do with the input of everyone else that's working on these problems, um, to use it in a particular way, including possibly 
as part of the ag mitigation uh, program. So we'll just leave leave that there. If there are questions, I'm sure Tom will allow them in just in just a minute or two. So I'm going to go back to slides of the thing I was supposed to be talking about, which was also on the list that Paul presented, which was intentionally created surplus in Lake Mead. I mentioned earlier when I was going through the list of the conservation that's been done since 2014 by many parties in Arizona, some of which was intentionally created surplus. In addition to that, there's intentionally created surplus in CAP's account in Lake Mead resulting from the agreements with Mexico under the minutes and, and other uh, ICS water that was created, say, from the, from the um, construction of Brock Reservoir, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, and some other things there. The graph on the right shows three categories. There is some current ICS that has been created in, C, in the CAP account of 126,800 acre feet. When I say current, it means it's fully accounted and validated by reclamation. There's another uh, 166,000 acre feet that is pending. The water is in the lake, but the accounting and validation process is not completed yet, and it's pretty complicated. We don't need to go into it here, but um, the other basin states basically need to approve the, the exhibit under which that ICS was created, and that's just not all that is not done yet. And then there's another 116,000 or so that we anticipate to create over the next couple of years, and most of that is from the Ag Forbearance III program that I men mentioned earlier. When you add all those up, it's around 400,000 acre feet. So today, in counting what's there, it's about th just shy of 300,000 acre feet. And then by the end of next year, we'll be almost 400,000 acre feet of intentionally created surplus. One of the things that the Drought Contingency Plan does is it allows Arizona and California and Nevada as well to take recovery of intentionally created surplus during shortage. So that's a two-sided coin there, and there's some, some, some favorable things about that and some things that folks don't like. But in this instance, it will allow the use of this asset to recover CAP or to cover intentionally created surplus. It's in the CAP account for mitigation, whether it's ag mitigation or other types of mitigation that we might need to do. It's in the lake, it's available for use all the way down to 1,025 feet in the lake. And how would that occur? One of two ways. They both would basically have the same outcome arithmetically, but how that would occur is we might choose to recover some of the ICS and say, as part of the CAP order, we're gonna order 50,000 extra feet, acre feet extra and deliver that even after we've taken our DCP cut and have 50,000 acre feet more to deliver. More likely than go through that complicated thing, we would say we're going to extinguish part of our obligation under DCP. So instead of saying a tier one taking 512,000 acre feet using my 50,000 acre foot example is we will take a 462,000 acre foot cut by satisfying 50,000 acre feet by converting some of our ICS to DCP ICS. And then that would still result in 50,000 acre feet more of water on the river that we could take to supplement our reduced supply to use for ag mitigation or something else. So that's a quick summary of two water resources. You still have to pay for delivery of those, but there are two water sources that are available right now between Lake Mead and Lake Pleasant that is somewhere between 300 and 450,000 acre feet. Just want everyone to understand that. We can have, I can answer some questions and I'm sure that we'll have more discussions about this in, in the ag mitigation uh, dive that we do after today. Tom, questions? Questions, Sandy. I'm sorry, I'm a little confused here. So you were going to create intentionally, and we're going to put in intentionally created surplus for a purpose, but we're going to use it during the shortage to supplement water? We could. We could. Yeah. I'm trying to figure out how that, I mean, I, I understand what you're saying about the accounting and how you, you just 
extinguish it. I get that. And when in, so you're not taking as big of a shortage. Um, I guess maybe I'm missing the whole purpose of DCP then, if it's to protect the lower levels. If we're taking it out, and, and I'm not saying, I mean, I understand what you guys are saying about California and Arizona can do that. I'm not really sure that's such a good idea either, but what are we, what are we doing it for? I mean, are we, are we cutting our nose off to spite our face? But and, I, and I know it's a dumb question, but I just want to, I, I just, I'm, I'm having a hard time getting my head wrapped around this one. I, I, thi I, think, what, well, I think what you're getting at is, um, is uh, either of the mechanisms that I described, whether we would take a release of, of ICS that's already been created, mm -hmm. or whether we would extinguish a portion of our, of our um, DCP reduction and, and basically take, take more. Um, uh, so let's use my second example. So under DCP Tier 1, we'd have a 512,000 acre foot reduction would be required of us. So instead of getting a million six, one million six thousand eight hundred thousand acre feet for CAP to deliver, we would get instead, say, at 1.1 million. If we were to extinguish part of our cut uh, by 50,000 acre feet, then we'd have 1,150,000 acre feet to deliver instead. And I think the point that you're making is, well, why not just leave that 50,000 acre feet in, in Lake Mead? Is that what? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're putting water in Lake Mead to ensure that we don't go below. And, and I'm, not, it, it, yeah. I'm not trying to, to say this won't work. I'm just trying to understand how it doesn't harm us in the long run. So we're trying to do something that keeps us from harm, but we're during shortage. We're we're doing we're doing what? We're, we're it's it's a trade-off. Simply yeah. put, it's it's a trade-off. If if this is if this is a an inexpensive, readily available resource for it to be used, that part of it may be used to do mitigation. Then it's a trade-off between how much do you leave in the lake and how much do you use in the state, in order to put this program together. The overall result of which, together with California, Nevada, and Mexico, and the United States, is to bend the curve in Lake Mead. Yeah, no, I, I get that. So the follow-up to that, if I may, Mr. Chairman, um, is what's the cost? I mean, what's the, what, I mean, if, if we're gonna take ICS, what is the cost of that water? Is it, I mean, it, you're taking one pool and moving it to another pool, potentially, I don't know. I mean, it just depends on if I'm taking, if you're taking m &I supply or Indian priority and using it for ICS and you're releasing it as an offset or as a trade-off, what's the cost of that? And how are you paying? The electricity to deliver it. Pardon? The electricity to deliver it. So it's still the, the ag cost to deliver it. Yes. What would happen, who pays the rest of that? Well, the fixed O&M is fixed O&M. Okay. And so the, 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 the delivery um, of, of um, an ICS release, whether it's actually released or just extinguished, um, would dilute the fixed O&M price per unit, but okay. the fixed O&M cost would remain whatever it was. Other questions? Okay, thanks, Ted. Mm -hmm. Moving on to the proposed next steps for CAP Ag Settlement. Uh, we want to convene a work group. That work group um, would be, uh, again, led by DWR and CAWCD. We had put some potential members up here CAP Ag, Hilo Community, Community, Arizona Legislature, Phoenix, Tucson, and Walton family. I'm not sure if all these folks want to participate. Um, we know some have already been, some have not been. But we are asking 
now if delegates want to volunteer to be part of this work group. They're not going to be public meetings per se, but the group will have a charge and a commitment to report back to the steering committee on their discussions and deliberations as part of the steering committee process. And, and that will be the opportunity for the public who are not delegates, who will not be participating to have their input and understanding of where that group is heading. In terms of the scope, we want to review the potential mitigation resources and identify other concepts to be discussed with the steering community. We heard some of those today. We heard those two from Ted. We heard, we saw Paul Orm's general list in his presentation. I'm sure other folks out there who might want to volunteer for this group might have some other ideas. And we know this is going to be an aggressive schedule, as is the entire DCP steering committee process. And we have already chosen August 15th from 2 to 5 at ADWR's building uh, for the first meeting, and then August 21st. So August 15th at DWR, August 21st up, up at CAP, trying to get two meetings under our belt before the next steering committee meeting <coughs> on August 23rd. Uh, if delegates do uh, volunteer to be part of this group, they don't they will not be required to attend themselves. They can have a staff member or their alternate attend on their behalf. We understand the nut there that needs to be met. And perhaps in certain situations, they have key staff people who might um, hit the ground running a little bit more on some of these ideas and help us move this thing forward more quickly. Um, again, we'd like to hear feedback right now from you all about this concept, about the scope, uh, and hopefully some folks coming forward to volunteer. So I'll throw it open to the committee members. Tim, if I can see that far. Uh, just two sons willing to continue our participation and, and attend these meetings. And I think it's good to be on an aggressive schedule because we have a lot of work to do. Um, Roosevelt Water will be there uh, for a couple of reasons, um, particularly understanding that the sensitivities associated with part of Maricopa County Ag's ability to help weather some of this drought mitigation has be because of our access to GSF and some of those partnering. Um, and also reiterating that one of the reasons, well, of the many reasons why Maricopa County Ag uh, was a part of the forbearance for the creation of ICS was to ensure that it would be there, not just for us, but for all the other participants associated in that lake conservation. And so we're gonna to wanna to make sure that if it becomes a part of the overall mitigation for ag, and there is certainly the potential for doing that, that we're not inadvertently harming the overall reason why we're attempting to do this. Um, so with that in mind, uh, co-chairs, uh, RWCD will be there on behalf of Maricopa County Ag, and we will make sure we've talked with the other folks um, from the irrigation district perspective as we get into those discussions. So again, I'd like to hear affirmatively from anyone on that list uh, and others. Sandy, you had your hand up first. I'm, I'm fine to defer to Cindy. But uh, I, I do want to say um, we, I'd, I would like to participate. I think industrial the industrial uh, group has um, some potential to, to offer some assistance. Um, I think it's uh, the the list that you have is is very important. Um, the one one I don't see is the feds. I, I think they need to be part of this group as well. Um, it, this you know providing incentives or storing in Pinal County. I don't have an issue with that. In fact, did it this year without any guarantees, just to you know to help them out really more than anything. But but also because. 
um, or going forward, I think there needs to be some discussions on or incentives to those who are willing to do that um, so that they can get their credits in the future. And there's there right now there's some in, you know, blocks to that, you know, financial blocks, those types of things through the wheeling or whatever you want to call it, system, system program. Um, so I think from that aspect, I think there are some solutions for folks who, who are storing now who can potentially store in Pinal to, to make that work. So uh, Sandy, Leslie was shaking her head yes. I take that as a yes, and I'm sure that's largely about funding from the feds. <laughs> <laughs> we got to push. Cindy. Phoenix is still in. Representative Bowers, anyone else from the legislature? Spencer is raising his hand. Yes, Spencer. Senator Rotondo. I'm going to be out of town on the 21st, but I would like to go to the first meeting just so I can keep abreast of what's being discussed. And we certainly recognize on this advanced schedule that not everyone that wants to be in that room will be at every single meeting. Chairman. The Thought North Nation wants to be included as part of And we have another uh, weigh in from Yuma, Wade. Thank you. Stephanie? Sorry, Virginia? Yes. Okay. Yes, I'd like to participate too. You know, while limited, I think the bank. Um, could provide some benefits um, from a water management perspective. Thank you. So another hand, was it Brian? Yeah, I, I, although Pima County Ag is such a small part. Great, thanks. Representative Gabaldon. <laughs> I'm sorry, Senator Tondo will be there on the And it's not for me to uh, uh, commit your staff, but legislators and staffs welcome on your behalf if I didn't make that clear already. <laughs> that on? How, how, yeah, CAP will be there. Uh, Lisa, I know we'll be at the first meeting. I'm unavailable, but uh, um, probably both of us at the second meeting. Okay, thank you. Kevin. Yeah, uh, Walton Family Foundation will be represented. Thank you. Tom, the healer of the community will, will attend as well. Tom. All right, thank you, Governor. <laughs> so Bill, I think, and then Cheryl. Uh, thanks, thanks, Tom. Um, since uh, the Pinal uh, Ag folks uh, have probably the biggest part of the of the focus of mitigation because of the size of the ag pool uh, effects. That's our biggest area of operations is in Pinal. So we, we definitely have an interest in, in sitting, sitting in the, with this group and either I or my, uh, my alternate will attend. Cheryl. The same for Valley Partnership. I feel like an auctioneer once I got oh. that first bid. <laughs> We're rolling along. The, the GRD will, will, would, would like to be there too, thank you. Okay, so we have a pretty robust, diverse group. Again, that first meeting, August 15th at DWR in our big 3175, I hope that's the right number, but our big room on the third floor. Uh, and we will dive into some of the things we talked about today, as Paul described at a deeper dive and get this uh, CAP Ag mitigation uh, discussion moving. And I, I appreciate Paul and, and Kevin, your willingness to get up today and, and put your ideas on the line. It's always tough to go first. And I think when we get into the smaller group, um, I expect to have some really good conversations and hear some good ideas and maybe hear a dose of realism in some cases on some ideas that might not work, but that's all part of the process. So moving forward, we did have uh, some couple of information requests at meeting number one. There was a request for a table and chart of CAP long-term contracts. We have some handouts, uh, but that include a link 
the CAWCD to get that information. And then we had that map and table of CAP agriculture. So again, hopefully that will uh, address the questions that were raised at meeting number one. So the next steps for this group, uh, the next steering committee meeting will be one to four on August 23rd up at CAP headquarters. And we talked about the CAP Ag Mitigation Group uh, standing up those first two meetings. Um, we had talked before and we know everybody is aching to see all of the draft lower basin development, sorry, lower basin drought contingency plan documents that are being worked on by the states. We did have some meetings last week in uh, Utah. There is a coordinating committee, better known as a bunch of lawyers and a drafting group that have been working very hard. I think uh, Nicole Clovis for DWR has been out of town probably four or five days out of the last two weeks working in that group moving forward with state representatives and uh, attorneys from uh, Interior Bureau Reclamation as well. So we're moving diligently forward with those documents. We're not quite at a point yet where they're far enough along in the process to share them publicly, but we will uh, try to get to that point as soon as we can. At the next meeting, we hope to discuss uh, a preliminary thoughts on a tribal intentionally created surplus program. Um, there'll be progress reports from the Ag Settlement Pool Mitigation Work Group. I also want to give people a heads up. <clears throat> August 15th, I believe, hopefully that's the right date, Reclamation will be doing the 24 month, August 24 month study. Important information about where we'll be in the operating criteria for the next water year and for the next calendar year. Uh, probabilities of where we might be in Lake Mead and Lake Powell the following year as well. Uh, those will be helpful as we continue to look at ways to potentially keep the lake above 1075. We've not abandoned that concept. We'll see what the opportunities are to make that happen for as many years as we can as we continue to work on these other issues, the four main elements. Uh, to deliver DCP, one of those elements being the Arizona Conservation Plan, which of course is linked into keeping the lake above 1075, or if that doesn't appear possible because of the volumes of water we might need, um, maybe what the next key elevation is we protect. We know how important it is to protect 1050. We've got to get to a discussion of when we start doing that. Probably not 1051, maybe not 1074, but That'll be an important part of the conversation. And so we'll continue to look for opportunities to do what we can uh, to keep Lake Mead above 1075. We understand all the benefits that that outcome uh, creates. So again, look for that material on August 15th. It will be up on DBR's website. I'm guessing it will be up on CAWC's website as well and reclamations. <laughs> Probably thereafter, Leslie, maybe in a week or 10 days the next version of the five-year probability table that many of you are familiar with, uh, that will look at <laughs> probabilities of various elevations in the lake and in, and in Lake Powell as well. Very important information. It really gets into this whole risk analysis and, and what we are face potentially facing in the near, in the near term. Uh, so with that, um, I want to turn it back over potentially for any additional the delegates, any of the delegates want to address any of the issues today or uh, share any information if they've had discussions with any of their constituent groups, I think now is the time on the agenda to do that. Okay, um, seeing none, uh, I think we can move on then to an opportunity for members of the public to address the steering committee on discussions we had today or other issues related to the lower basin development, uh, lower basin drought contingency plan. I keep thinking about money. Anyone in the public want to make comment or ask questions?
Thanks. My name is Alan Delaney. I'm the Water Policy Administrator for the City of Peoria. Uh, my comment uh, addresses the Lake Pleasant um, mitigation alternative. Um, Lake Pleasant is an important recreational facility for the Northwest Valley. Peoria is the gateway to Lake Pleasant, and, rec and we realize a great deal of economic value from the recreational use of that lake. Um, we note that fluctuating, um, while levels may fluctuate in the lake, the additional removal of 50 to 70,000 acre feet, perhaps as much as 200,000 acre feet, may have a negative impact on the recreational use of the lake. We point this out simply to note that um, there's really no, no uh, mitigation alternative that won't have some sort of economic impact on some other entity. Um, that said, we remain in support of the LBDCP process and we um, um, definitely want it to reach a successful conclusion. But we just want everyone to realize there will be an impact. What was that? <laughs> thanks, thanks, Alan. Someone, I saw another hand. Doug, please introduce yourself as well and who you represent. Uh, Doug Dunham, I'm with EPCOR Water. Um, uh, since I'm the third tier down and not uh, old enough to sit at the big people's table. Uh, I just wanted to let you know that EPCOR would want also want to sit in with the uh, Ag Mitigation uh, Committee. If you hadn't left DWR, I might have let you sit at the table. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? <laughs> did Wade, did, did I see someone over here? Anyone else from the uh, public? Final call to the delegates. Uh, if not, we are adjourned. I will just say thank you for your attention as we've gone through so much educational material. That will be a constant in this process. Thank you all. Thank you.